Hello and welcome back, you guys. I'm Miss Whiting and we are continuing with our online mini reading lessons this week. Now, by now, chances are you have probably heard that Governor Abbott has mandated that all schools remained, remain closed. Um, so sadly, we will not be headed back to our school building and we will not be able to see you guys face to face as we had all hoped. Um, this truly does not make any of us very happy. We miss you guys so much. We want to see your faces. Um, we've been so thankful for those of you that have been getting on our Zoom calls. Um, if you have not had a chance to do that, um, please reach out to your teacher to get connected to when they are doing their cluster Zoom calls, okay? Um, we love seeing your faces. We love connecting with you guys that way. I know that our cluster had a fantastic time last Friday and got to see some new faces that we hadn't seen in a while. So, um, so what this means is we will continue these online lessons um, through the end of the school year, okay? So school is still in session, it's just not in the school building, all right? So um, we will continue with our online reading lesson. Um, and every day you'll get a video from me for reading, whether it's teaching you a lesson like I've been doing with argumentative text or just explaining the assignment for the day. So either one of these, you will all, either one of those, you will always see um, a lesson or a video from me in one of those ways. So um, continuing with last week's skill, let's see here, argumentative text. Um, we are going to continue with that this week, and so I'm going to go ahead and start with the teak. So just as a reminder, we are uh, focusing on 5.9e, which says, recognize characteristics and structures of argumentative text by, and there's three parts. So I, identifying the claim. I, I, explaining how the author has used facts for or against an argument. And I, I, I identifying the intended, uh, intended audience or reader. All right, so let's re just do a quick review, okay? Um, the very purpose of argumentative text, so why an author would choose to write this, is to persuade or convince you, me, the reader, to think or act in a certain way. Um, so we talked about persuade, um, before we've talked about it before in um, just throughout the throughout the school year and it's just a way to um, try to convince someone to think the way you're thinking or to believe the thought that you um, have thought um, but in argumentative text there's a little bit more to it there's some different parts to it so the main part of an argumentative piece is something called a claim, okay? And a claim is basically just the author's opinion about a topic. So it's what they think about a certain topic. So last week we were, um, I read the example passage about homework, right? Um, and there was um, the uh, author, the writer was, um, trying to persuade the reader that they should not have homework, right? His claim was that there should not be homework in school. There should just have all the work should be done through the school day, and then there should be free time to rest and uh, do other extracurricular things after school. That was his claim. That was his opinion on the subject. Um, and then there's reasons for the claim. So some of his reasons were, um, so remember here looking at the page, um, so number one was being able to go home and rest instead of doing all this homework would help prepare students for the next day. So that was one of his reasons why there shouldn't be homework. Um, that second one was that students' brains are no longer engaged after seven hours of work, so meaning you know, after being gone at school all day, people, their uh, students' brains just aren't gonna, you know, really be able to focus on homework. So what's the point? Kind of brains need a rest. That was the second reason. And then the third one was uh, children need time to exercise. So he's, his point was, um, or third reason was, you know, we shouldn't have homework because when they get home, if they're bogged down with doing more desk work, that they're not going to get enough exercise. You know, they don't get enough exercise in PE. Um, so he had these three reasons um, why he thought that homework shouldn't be given out. 
to students, right? There should be, should be do, away, do away with homework is basically what his point was or his claim. Um, and then if you keep going further down, there's the claim. Then there's the reasons, which I just said, the three reasons. Then there's supporting evidence that kind of goes and supports both the claim and the reasons for it. Um, and in this case, if you remember from last week, the boy with the homework um, article, he actually gave some uh, examples. He gave some facts. Um, I'm trying to remember this. The first one he gave was he interviewed some parents. There was a parent interview. So um, there's some information there. Um, he then uh, looked at a survey. There's a survey done um, that showed that homework grades versus grades on assignments in class, like the difference in how uh, students scored lower on homework grades. And then um, he actually quoted some or excuse me, he cited some evidence done by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and so he gave all this supporting evidence, right, to that, that kind of went with his claim and supported his reasons. They kind of go with both. And so those, all those things, along with one more thing, make up an argumentative text. Now, I talked about audience, right? who the intended reader was, the article was made for. And we talked about with the homework article, it was probably not other students because other students probably agree with him. And, but more important than that, students really can't do, can't, aren't the ones in charge of changing that policy. So we talked about how his intended audience was probably either teachers or principals, right? Okay, that's just a real quick synopsis of what we talked about last week. I wanna go ahead and give you one more example this week um, that we're going to read through and discuss the different parts of. Okay, so this one is basketball versus baseball. Now I know I have some baseball players here and some basketball players as my students, so I have a feeling you guys probably have uh, some strong opinions on this, um, but we'll see where we land after we look through and see what this particular author's claim is. Is it basketball or baseball? And then his reasons for it. Okay. All right. So here we go. I'm going to read out loud. You can go ahead and read along with me. Okay. It says basketball versus baseball. Basketball is an amazing sport to play. I know a lot of kids at our school play baseball, but I'm here to tell you that basketball is a much better sport. Y'all, I'm going to stop right there. What's his claim? What's his claim? Basketball is a much better sport. And he pretty much just said it right here. I'm here to tell you that basketball is a much better sport. Now, remember, a claim is just an author's opinion, someone's opinion. Remember, there's no right or wrong with opinions. It's just what they think or believe, okay? And I can already tell he's here to try to convince us, persuade us that um, why basketball is a much better sport, right? Maybe get us to think the same way. So let's keep going. It says, unfortunately, at our school, you can't play both sports because they play at the same time of year. So for some of you, it's time to choose. Tryouts are right around the corner where will you be? Basketball is much more fast paced than baseball. I have watched and played plenty of both and baseball can be kind of boring. When you play basketball, you are constantly running up and down the court when you play. Baseball players often hang out on the bases for long periods of time while they wait for their teammates at bat. Now there's our first reason, or yes, our first reason to support his claim. What is it? Well, that very first line, right? What's his reason? Well, it says basketball is much more fast paced than baseball. Now that is his first reason. I'm gonna go ahead and underline that. Why he thinks that basketball is better than baseball. That's his first reason, okay? Um, and he goes on to say he's watched and played plenty of both. And, you know, baseball can kind of be kind of boring. It's, you know, again, it's his opinion, right? Let's go ahead and go to the next paragraph. Let's see what other reasons he gives us. It says, um, I've, been, I've been to plenty of basketball and baseball games. 
and the average basketball game lasts about one hour, while baseball games can last over two hours. That's a lot of time sitting in the dugout waiting for something to happen. If you play basketball, you'll have plenty of time to get home and do your work. Hmm, so what's his second reason? Just read it, didn't I? Right here it says, doo -doo 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 -doo. if you play basketball, you'll have plenty of time to get home and do your homework. <laughs> so I actually do know that that is true. I've had a lot of students who um, have had baseball games and man, you baseball players, y'all can stay up real late playing those games. So he gives some, that's his reason and some of his evidence here is his actual um, uh, attendance at some of these games. He, he's been to these before, so he knows. Like he's got personal experience with those games. Let's go ahead and keep going. See what other reason he's got. It says, you also have more of an opportunity to play in, a ba in basketball games. There are 11 players on the basketball team, but 25 on the baseball team. You have way more chances to play in basketball than in baseball. You have way more chances. Okay, so what's his reason for basketball being better? His third reason for basketball being better than uh, baseball. I just read it right there. It says, you also have more of an opportunity to play in basketball games. So already he's given us three reasons. One, basketball is much more fast paced than baseball. Two, you'll have plenty of time to get home and do your homework. And three, you also have more of an opportunity to play in basketball games um, because the, just by sheer fact by the amount of players that there are, all right? So let's keep going. So we've got our three reasons. Let's see if um, he's got anything else in here. Let's see if there's a counterclaim. So maybe he can give us other reasons, uh, excuse me, an opposite opinion. Um, and let's see if we can figure out who our intended audience is going to be. It says, some people say that basketball is a more dangerous sport because there is more contact and you can get hurt easier. Does that go along with what he says? Does that go along with basketball being better? No, that's actually going along that with the opposite, right? Because it's saying that some people say that basketball is more dangerous. So I'm going to underline this sentence because this is our counter claim. It is the opposite opinion of what our author has. Some people say that basketball is a more dangerous sport because there is more contact and you can get hurt more easily. So I'm going to go ahead and just write in here, counter claim. Okay, counter claim. Well, and he keeps going, I disagree. A ball traveling 90 miles per hour straight at your head is a lot more dangerous than a seventh grader running into you. According to statistics in the Daily Times, more than 25 people in our city have been injured at basketball or baseball games by foul balls. So what is he giving us? Now he's giving us uh, some evidence, some supporting evidence as to why this is not a great counterclaim. He's like, mm, no, I don't think so, because technically there have been more injuries from baseball games, and, you know, he cites this a ball traveling 90 miles per hour straight at your head. It could be a lot more dangerous than a seventh grader running into you. So again, that's kind of his evidence that's supporting his, uh, the fact that he does not agree with that counterclaim. And then moving on down, it says basketball is clearly the safer, more fast paced option for students wanting to try out for a sport this year at Lincoln Middle School. If you want constant action, quick games and lots of playing time, I'll see you at basketball tryouts. Okay, I think right there we have some evidence for our audience. I'll read that last sentence one more time. It says, if you want constant action, so if you want constant action, quick games, and lots of playing time, I'll see you at basketball practice. So is he talking to the parents? Mm -mm. Who's going to be at basketball practice or tryouts, I should say? It would be other students, right? So in this case, and I'm going to underline that here in purple. If you, 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 right there. Um, the people who are going to be trying out for basketball are going to be other students. So our audience, 
So I'm going to write it down here. Our audience, our intended audience that this person is writing to is going to be other students, right? I know it's kind of squished there, sorry. Um, students. He's not writing this to parents. He's not writing it to principals like that last time. He's writing it to other students. He um, is trying to convince them that, hey, you guys, baseball is more dangerous, is slower paced, um, it's going to take more time, and you're not going to have you know, as many opportunities to play as you will with basketball. Basketball is a much better sport. He's trying to convince you. And he's trying to convince who exactly? You being possibly the other students that are in that uh, Lincoln Middle School. Okay, so we've gone through over all the parts here. Okay, um, and when you're reading an argumentative text, so for example, last week you read, let wild animals be wild. Um, when you read that, hopefully as you were reading it, you were able to think through what the claim was for that story. Now, do you remember what the claim was for that story? Were you able to figure it out? Now, did you look at that title? Did you look at the title? Let me come back here. Let wild animals be wild. So if you didn't guess by the title itself, let wild animals be wild. Once you got into the story, let's see if I can move this over here so we can see it better. Um, I've, I've gone ahead and highlighted a few things for you. So in that first paragraph, and like I said, in, in every argumentative text, they're going to tell you their claim almost right away. They may give you some introductory information or sentences, um, but they're going to tell you. So I've highlighted it here. It says, the goal of both actions should be to release animals back into the wild where they belong. That is this author's opinion. That is his claim, okay? Um, so for that first question in your check for understanding, um, that is the claim of this text. They think that wild animals should be let to be wild. They should not be kept in captivity. Now, as you read the story, there were, uh, there were a couple of reasons that um, this author gave us. So let me see if I can make this a little bit zoomed out. Here we go. Um, there are a couple reasons. So he goes on to say, you know, keeping animals alive in captivity is not the final purpose of conservation. Real success comes when animals are plentiful and strong enough to return to their natural habitat. So this just kind of goes along with his claim, meaning that um, it's not just keeping them safe, but really the goal is to get them back out into the wild. It continues on with the story of the California condor. So he's giving it a real life example. Okay, he's using actual facts that support his claim. So anything here that you guys um, underlined where, um, you know, it that it worked it says back here no one's sure if it worked but it did work by the end of 2015 the total population of the condors was up to 435 these are actual facts and evidence that support his claim given this example of the california condors now there's a couple more reasons as we as we read through in paragraph six it says returning wild animals to the wild is good for both animals and people. So he's like, yes, yeah, because it's good for both animals and people. It says all natural benefits, all of nature benefits when an endangered species is restored to its habitat. So there's another reason for letting them be wild. He kind of then gives another example of a keystone species like this beaver. Okay. Um, it talks about how that was an important, um, an important, um, a good, important example of how um, beavers were let back out into the wild and how it supported the ecosystem there. Um, then it goes on, it says animals can benefit in another way when they are released into the wild. Um, so then it goes on and gives us some more information. It talks about them putting devices on the animals. Um, it then talked about the Siberian tiger. 
um, again, talking about how they were monitoring them and because being able to be monitored out in the wild, they were able to um, give them more resources, resources. They were able to see what else they needed to help them to survive. Um, then it goes on to say that another reason would be that releasing the animals into the wilds also makes financial sense. And it gives some examples there as to um, some actual hard evidence as to an example of, of a situation where it was, um, uh, it did make financial sense. Like it made financial sense because in this case, um, they were able to, you know, people want to see these animals in the wild. And so they were able to kind of lure more tourists into these areas, which then for the, that area would bring money, right? Um, now, those are some of the reasons. And I just kind of highlighted them here and there along the way and talked about some of the examples. Um, but like any good argument to the text, it's also going to include the counterclaim. So if you kept reading, it said a couple of times where it said, you know, some people argue against releasing these animals. And, you know, here I've highlighted two. It says these animals um, raised, they say animals raised or rehabilitated in captivity can't survive on their own. So there, that's what the other uh, claim would be. But then if you keep reading, it says, however, scientists are learning more and more about what wild animals need to live independently, meaning they're learning more and more that they can live independently um, if you carefully prepare them for life, that they can do it successfully. So he kind of debunks that argument. And then they give another one. It says, other people say that reintroducing predators to the wild is bad for humans. But they, can, they might attack us. They might attack the livestock. And then he goes and he kind of proves that wrong. He says, but animals that live in a balanced ecosystem with adequate food and space rarely hurt people or livestock. And then it goes on to give some more examples and facts that uh, disprove that particular argument. So this story has kind of has all the elements of an argument to text. It has the claim has reasons for the claim, it has supporting evidence for the claim, and it even included a couple of counterclaims that he was able to debunk pretty quickly. Now, what do you think the audience is for this? Now, this was in your reading textbook, right? So the audience was intended for you, the reader, probably just the, the gen gen general uh, population um, of humanity. They're, they're probably trying to appeal to our good nature to, get, you know, be behind any causes that help uh, these animals to get released back into the wild after they've had proper care, right? All right. Now, this was just a real quick review over what we um, did last week. Now, this week, we are going to be looking at a different text. Um, this particular text has to do with a counterclaim. So there, these are paired texts. So the text we did last week, as I've just gone over, is claiming that, hey, we need to release these animals back into the wild. Now this week's text is saying, don't release animals back to the wild. Now, you're not going to read the story today. Today, we're just going to introduce the vocabulary, but I did want to give you a heads up. So, our vocabulary word today is cooperate. Can you say it with me? Cooperate. Hmm. Co -a -er -ate. Cooperate. To cooperate means to work together. I believe in our book, it says, there it is, to work together, participate in a shared activity. So you know what? I have a feeling that um, you guys probably know what this means. Um, I could say the sentence, Mrs. Whiting's students cooperate in a class project, meaning that they're working together in a class project, right? It means to work together, and we always... Um, try to find ways for you guys to cooperate well together, right? Um, so that is going to be in this text. Now, I do want to just refresh your memory on last week's words because you may still see these words um, in, your, in your text. So sanctuaries, remember that? That just meant that it's a place for animals to be protective and taken care of. Diminished 
means to make fewer of. So some of the animals, animal populations were diminished, right? Um, to thrive means to live fully and well, to prosper and grow. And unfettered means not chained, not held back, free to do whatever. I believe in that last um, um, vocabulary lesson, we had the picture of the monkeys and they were just kind of free to roam. They were unfettered. Had they been fettered, they probably would have been in a cage, locked up, not free to roam around very much. Um, so let's talk about today's activity, today's assignment. So today's assignment is going to be creating a word cycle, okay? So if you are um, one that is doing paper packets, then this will be in the back of your um, assignments sheet. Uh, you know, the sheet that looks like this where it has a list of everything. Now this is last week's, but um, on the back of that, um, you should have a word cycle form. And if you're on Google Classroom, then yours will be in a little doc that we'll have attached to the assignment, okay? So if you recall, this is how a word cycle goes. Now you'll notice I've put already the words that you guys are going to be using. Now these are our vocabulary words from last week and inc I included cooperate the, from this week. So I'm going to go ahead and read the directions to you. It says write the connection between each of the five words in the order of the arrows. So you see the arrows? Um, it says number two starting with sanctuaries and diminished. So we'll have a connection here then diminished and unfettered, a connection here, and so on. So I figured that I would go ahead and show you one example. Now, you do not have to use my example, but if you want to for your final product that you're going to be turning in, um, you can use mine. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start the first one. Technically, if you want to start with any of the other ones, it doesn't matter because you're going to eventually get to them. Okay, and just like we taught you guys in class, you just write the sentence off to the side. There's, there's space here off to the side. Okay, so sanctuary. So let's think this through. We know that a sanctuary is kind of like a safe haven, a safe place for animals to be protective and protected and well taken care of. And we know diminished means to get fewer or smaller. So could we say that in sanctuaries, animals are prevented from diminishing? Or might we say in sanctuaries, animals don't diminish? We could probably say something like that. Let's see if we can think through a simple way. How about this? When animals, or when a species of animals diminishes, it might be good for them to be placed in a sanctuary. I'm gonna go with that one. <laughs> now notice that I, I kind of changed um, my ending, right, to diminish, I can use the base word and I can take out the suffix ed, diminish, I can add ing, I can add es, I can change how the word is used as long as I keep that base word, okay? And as long as it has the same, by changing the uh, suffix, it keeps the same meaning, okay? So, well, I forgot already what I said, you guys. What did I say? I said, if a species of animals or animal species of animal or say animal is and I'm gonna say diminishing so I changed my ending there right but it still has um, the base meaning right getting smaller if the species of animals is um, diminishing comma they should be placed in a sanctuary if a species of animal is dimin diminishing they should be placed in a sanctuary and i'm going to underline the word so 
here I have sanctuary. Now I also made sanctuary singular, didn't I? The original word was plural. That's okay. Still has the same meaning as far as the base meaning. It's a place that keeps animals safe, like a safe haven. Um, and then diminishing, diminished means to be made fewer. Diminishing in the process of being made fewer. So kind of similar base meanings. Okay, so that is my connection between sanctuaries and diminished. Now, what you are going to do for your assignment today is go ahead and make a connection between diminished and unfettered. Now, you guys saw my thought process. It kind of took me a while to kind of come up with a good sentence that I was okay with. It is okay if it takes you guys a little bit longer to kind of make a connection. And it is okay to ask for a parent's help or a sibling's help. Absolutely, go for it. Um, the key here is that you're able to make a connection between all of these words, okay? So diminished and unfettered, put that here. Then come up with a connection between unfettered and thrived. I can think of one already. Um, think of a connection between thrive and cooperate. Cooperate, write that here. And then think of a connection between cooperate and sanctuaries. Think of that and put that right in here. So there's a little bit of space. Uh, and if you write small enough, you should be able to have um, plenty of room for your connections, okay? All right, you guys, that is the assignment for today. Quick review of argumented text, introduction to your new word for the week, cooperate, um, and the word cycle is what your assignment will be for today, okay? Check back with me tomorrow for tomorrow's um, assignment explanation, and we will see you next time. Goodbye.